rock climbers have been lured into a dangerous challenge. Besides the harsh northern climate, there is the constant distraction of the sea moving and crashing beneath. But to Henry Barber, a 23-year-old climber from America, this is just like his New England home. I happen to like sea cliff climbing more than almost any other climbing. Basically, I love the ocean and I love the mountains, and I, I've always lived in an atmosphere where I could enjoy both. Henry Barber is in Wales on a climbing holiday, testing the limits of his skill on the coarse sea cliffs for all the roots of strange poetic names, like Dream of White Horses, Liberator, and this narrow crack up a crumbling vertical wall called Strand. Strand has been climbed by teams with ropes, but never alone without ropes or aids. Soloed, as climbers say. Although Strand's unique position was one of the lures that drew Henry to England, there were other enticements. Britain has many excellent climbers, and therein lies another kind of excitement. Climbing with the best in your field is another way of finding out how good you are. And so before attempting Strand, Henry went to Cornwall to climb a route called Liberator with an Englishman, Pete Livesey, a top caver, kayaker, and climber, a heavyweight, just like Henry. And though the climb required them to be tied together, one leading, then the other, underneath the surface, beneath the laughter and good cheer, a fierce competition rages. Now, meet Pete Livesey. About halfway up is a little overhang to negotiate. Under this is a pin that's normally used for aid. In fact, nobody has yet done it without the aid. And of course, I'll have to try and do it without the aid, because if I don't, um, Henry certainly will. It's a kind of a, a competition again. But as I am leading, if I opt to use the aid, and Henry does it without, then I feel as though he's beaten me. The trick here is to sneak off right around the corner, around the arete, onto a little hidden ledge, and it's possible to take a rest here. If things get too difficult, you always think at the back of your mind, I can get out of here, I can jump in the sea, and that's it, I'll, I'll be free. Of course, it's not true. You wouldn't have much chance of getting out of the sea, but it, it just seems to be there. It's a psychological thing, I'm sure. I move back left around the corner to the pin. I had a couple of attempts at climbing the move free, but in the end, my face and eyes were covered in sweat. My hands were covered in sweat. Chalk was everywhere, and I just gave in, grabbed hold of the pin and used it to pull up and move over the roof. It's kind of a, a psychological relief when you grab hold of it and it's there and it's firm. But a couple of seconds later, you know that you've given in, that you've lost that particular part of the competition. And you know sure as sure that Henry will do it free. On the other hand, he won't be leading. He'll be on the other end of the rope. And this makes it a lot easier. And you can kind of console yourself with that thought when he's powering over the roof. But perhaps another day, I'll do it without. Henry's coming up now, and he's climbing very fast, which is a bit annoying, because we'd like him to have difficulty on it. Because he knows that, and he's climbing as fast as possible. Climbing is an extension of walking. You always have to be concentrating on your, your footwork, even when you're going over an overhang. You want to take as much strain off your arms as possible, and this is done by using your feet. And if you can get one hand over the lip of the overhang and then get a foot over, you're immediately taking strain off the other parts of your body. He's probably bummed out that I did the roof move without the aid, but yeah, that's really his problem. It probably has to do with the English climber's grabbiness for first ascents. And for me, that's really not what climbing's all about. See you soon. Yeah, yeah. It's Henry's turn to lead the last pitch now. It's very steep. 
and each move is quite strenuous. But if you climb very fast and forget about protection, then it's a very easy pitch to do. It's certainly a very easy pitch to, to second. Henry's climbing it, and he's spending a tremendous long time hung under the roof above the stands, trying to get some protection in. I'm sure I couldn't spend that long hanging there. But Henry's strong. There's a good, there's a good protection placement above him. I know it's there, but I'm not going to tell him, because he, he seems to want to hang there under the roof, using up all his strength. In a situation like this, you have a crack in the back of a corner, and use a technique called laybacking, where you pull with your hands in the crack and push with your feet against the slab to reduce the strain on your arms and leg muscles. After the difficult layback and overhang section in the last pitch of Liberator, you still have to be careful because the climbing eases up quite a bit, but after you've done difficult climbing on a, a route of this nature, you can very easily make mistakes on easier ground when your runners are further apart. You could fall a long way. And once you've reached the end of the pitch, all you have to do is belay your second up and climb's over. I remember when Henry Barber first came over here to climb, he set out to impress the British climbers. And I'm sure he would have done, but he reckoned without the great beer drinking tradition of British climbers. It is considered unsportsmanlike to go out climbing without having drunk vast quantities of beer beforehand. Henry wasn't into beer drinking at the time, but I think he's been training since then. We notice the difference now. He's come back here and he can drink the beer as well as climb. Competition moves off the cliffs and into the local pub. The spirit is still one of fierce, friendly sport. Here, getting the worst of it at arm wrestling is Al Harris, an Englishman who's a close friend of Henry Barber's. In the morning, they plan to climb a route called Dream of White Horses. But in true British climbing fashion, the night before is spent in revelry. Dream of White Horses. That's what the rock climbers call this route in Wales. Henry Barber climbed it before and is familiar with Dream, but this morning mist will alter everything. The route is a horizontal traverse and is being led by Al Harris. We went to do Dream of White Horses. I'd heard about this route for years. I'd never done it before. And although everybody praised it, it was supposed to be one of the classic routes in uh, North Wales. The Climbing was supposed to be not too hard, but in sensational position, really exposed and very frightening. I didn't foresee too much difficulty, so therefore, when I found the first pitch hard, it rather surprised me. Uh, I set off on the first pitch, and there was a big line of holes leading up, looking really easy, uh, over to the left in the general direction of where I was going. So I started up climbing up there. There was no definite spike, so I couldn't get any protection on. Uh, Henry shouted up that he thought I was perhaps going a bit too high. He'd done it some time before and seemed to remember it going lower than where I was. But it seemed the obvious line to me, so I continued on up, getting myself further and further out into a frightening position. A fall would have resulted in rather bad consequences, a really long way. I would have fallen something like 100 feet at that point. It looks harder lower down. It looks harder lower. It's not easy. It's a 50 foot run out here without any protection. And there's still no sign of any runners. No, oh, there's, there's good runners about 20 feet below you. Oh, you mean I'm in the wrong place? I don't think I went there. <coughs> oh, man, it's a frightening place. Come on. It's starting to rain, you know. I want a runner. I'd like to do this in the rain. 
Is there no running on this pitch? Yes, there are. Where? I don't know. I want one. <laughs> It's very good to have competition in climbing where Al and myself say are fooling around, laughing. Huh? He's gripped, and I say, oh, it's no problem. So what if you fall 30 feet? But that's, that's a friendly competition, and friendly competition spurs one person on to do moves that otherwise he wouldn't be able to do if there was just a blob sitting on the other end of the rope playing. It became obvious that Al picked the wrong line. It was in a really difficult spot. He found some small cracks and put in some poor protection. He was relatively safe there, but he was still stuck in the middle of nowhere. And I was trying to figure out a way to get to this large crack at the end of the pitch. You can find a move hard, and the fear builds up in you as you do that move. The strength drains out your fingers, you get frightened, which draws your strength off again. And so then the whole thing becomes much more serious and it can build up very quickly like that. So you have to remain completely calm and calculating throughout. And any fear that rises in you, you have to control and cut off. Oh, oh. Nearly. OK, I'm going to try this. So of any sport that involves fear and risk gives me a, a buzz from it. I get a buzz from it, that's all. <laughs> the more you climb, the more you get used to the vertical environment, the moving on rock, and eventually it becomes like walking down the street. The time has come. The decision has been made. Henry Barber will attempt a solo climb the crack wall called Strand. When he took his climbing holiday to Britain, this sheer cliff 600 feet above the ocean with its treacherously loose surface was in his thoughts. Henry Barber is a good climber, but this challenge is truly on the edge of his ability. This is not a safe climb. On hand are a few English climbers, and on the right, our guide, Al Harris. This climb, the Strand, starts from a 55 degree grass slope with ferns and heather growing on it, which falls some three to four hundred feet down to the rocks and the sea below. Once you've gone above about a thirty foot level on the vertical rock above the grass, any fall would be fatal, because the speed you hit the grass would continue to bounce down it. It would be far too great to effect any braking. Usually when hard climbs are soloed, the person who's soloing them does them on a rope beforehand so that he can be sure of the moves and know that he is technically capable of getting up it. In this case, Henry's never done the climb before, so he's soloing it on site, as climbers say. It has never been soloed before, let alone on site. He's doing a very strenuous lie back move now, putting his foot up really high, and he's going to pull up onto that foot and thereby gain some three or four feet in one move. Nicely done, Henry. Once you've started generally soloing, then it's very hard to stop and come back. You set your mind on the target, you condition yourself, and you climb like a machine, or you try to climb like a machine, without any emotional stress and things coming into it, which are only dangerous influences which uh, make it more dangerous. You can't overcome fear by saying that this is high and this is low and this is safe and this is not. You can only overcome fear 
by being very cruel and calculating in all your maneuvers. In other words, every move that you do, you have to be able to down climb. Every single step you take, you have to be convinced that you can make it back down. A very hard move, which could be easier, but you do the harder move because it's easier to stretch down from the hold, the foothold to the handhold. Soloing is a very personal thing, and it's very hard to share it with anybody because it's very selfish. There's a lot at stake. It's not really your life that you're giving away. You're not playing it for you. You're playing it for everybody. You're playing it for your girlfriend. You're playing it for your parents. You're playing it, in my case, for my parents, who have made it possible for me to, to climb and do what I do. In solo climbing, you have to overcome a great number of odds, whether it be strength, whether it be too much drinks the night before, whether it be a subconscious feeling. So you're thinking about all these different things, and maybe the looseness of rock, or maybe bees, maybe it's bee season, or maybe it's lichen on the root, or maybe it's dirt, or maybe it's birds, or maybe there's swallows in the cracks in El Dorado, or maybe it's seagulls in these sea cliff climbs. And you think about all these things, and you have to get them all straight and in order. You have to douse all these real feelings about your family, about your friends, about the people that are watching you. I mean, it, what gives you the right to go out and kill yourself in front of 20 people or whatever? Anyone who pitches for a living. The next few moves can be climbed by partially hand jamming in the crack. Some small finger jams and some part of your hand goes in. You do this by pushing your hand in and then try to make a clenched fist against the sides of the crack, which uh, acts as quite a good hand hold. He must be getting very tired now. He continuously uses his arms. Can't really rest much there, though, because it's so steep. The heat up there must be incredible. It's a white face and it reflects the sun. It's like a, a big mirror drawing the sun in. Sun trap. You can see the sweat glistening on his legs when he's sweating so much. Now he'll be able to lean on his right hand and rest his left hand. And then he'll put his left hand and then lean back and rest his right hand until his arms come back to full strength again or near enough. And then he'll feel confident enough to move on. He's got some 20 feet of 25 feet of hard climbing to do now and uh, then he's safe. But it is the steepest part of the climb, and if he's used a lot of his energy already, which he's bound to have done, then it makes it uh, very hard. You're continually hanging on your hands and your fingertips and uh, having to do strenuous pull-ups. He's not got very good hand-holds there. Ah, oh, that's better. He's got a better position now. He's got his left foot on a much better hold. Oh, man. Go for it. Oh, fire it off, baby. <laughs> <laughs> He's amazing. Doing another one of these long pull-ups, these long lie-back moves. Seems to be the character of the climb that you have to continuously do these as the only holds are in the crack. It must be incredibly hot up there. He's sweating profusely. Having to continually dip his hand and tilt back to maximize the friction of his fingers on these small holds. When he leaves this position now, he will not be able to rest for the next 20 feet, so he'll have to do continuous moving. Working out each move as he moves. Here he goes. He's reaching up into that hole. There's a reasonable hold in there, which you can use to the utmost. Oh, man, his leg's shaking. He's coming down. That didn't look very nice at all. It's extremely unstable.
this, but I get this. Some strength back to do these last moves. He can only rest one arm at a time, though, because it's so steep, so he's hanging completely on one arm while he rests the other one. Uh, he's moving up now. Uh, he's got it better this time. Yes, nice move, Henry. Yes. Only one more move and he can reach some good holds on the top. He's very dirty there, though. There's lots of um, sandy stuff in the cracks. And it makes it hard to grip properly. One more move, Henry. I know you're tired, but one more move. There he goes. Get your left hand up for that good hold. That's it, that's it. Yes, nice. Yes. Very bold solo. The last part is big holds, well spaced, not too bad, and it became very hard because I knew it would be easy. And because I wasted the strength, or used up the strength earlier on in the climb, this became very hard. The flowers are beautiful on this moss and stuff that you've got to climb, but you can make a mistake by grabbing a bush that's not solid. You can make a mistake by standing on some moss that's a little bit wet and might break away, whereas if it was dry, it might be a good foothold. You can walk up through beautiful meadows at the top, which is nice. But what you really want to do is just get off that rock, get onto those meadows, and just stroll away. And maybe look at seagulls, maybe look at seals, maybe look at cliffs. But really get into why you're soloing in the first place. If you're soloing for freedom, you're soloing for a freeness of movement, and you're soloing perhaps to be alone. Once you've done a number of solo ascents like this on site, the only thing you can have left in soloing is to solo easier routes to enjoy yourself, to get this rhythm going. Maybe like doing an, a dance exercise. And I had rhythm in Dream White Horses. Everything was together. In England, the climbers are still talking about the American conquering strand. But to Henry Barber, his fondest memory was of Dream of White Horses a solo ballet performed on a tilted stage. I really enjoyed the rock. I really enjoyed the moves, the variety of footholds, slanting, downslopey, good finger holds, layback holds, jam holds. Everything was there. So on Dream, I had it all together. It was beautiful. This was good last time, wasn't it? Last time I did this. The mist and everything gave this climb a certain aura, a feeling, an atmosphere, a mood. And this is the same mood or feeling or atmosphere that you get when you go to a museum and you look at a certain painting. And every time you go back to that museum, you'll probably go back to this painting because it's something that you really see something in, you really enjoy.
It's all because you're going for the ultimate. You're going for the ultimate rhythm. And if you can walk well up and down stairs, if you can skate well, if you can ski well, if you can drive a car well through S turns, if you can do anything well and do it with the best motion, the, the finest line, the most rhythmic feeling, and get all these things working together, then you've accomplished it. You've, you've made it. This is doing the ultimate thing you can do. And this is what soloing is. And to piece a rhythm together, to piece totally uninhibited, unstructured, and totally free set of moves, set of circumstances together, which soloing is. It's not just climbing, it's, it's, the, it's the life. Each of us discovers inside ourselves abilities that can lead us to excellence. But we must steadfastly pursue that which we do well, and thereby we master ourselves and our world.